Morning. I'm never quite sure when this starts recording, so I'll just start talking here. I've been checking things on the news and listening to a few people, and I've seen the odd thing on Facebook about people drinking more than usual and some of the problems that that causes. And it, it certainly does. I know one of the police officers that I was chatting with the other day was saying that there's an increase in calls related to domestic disturbances, that kind of thing. I know a friend of mine who works up north has said that that's becoming a bigger issue up there. And certainly if people have more time on their hands than usual, and I talked about this a few times already, people have more time on their hands than usual, and they do like to drink, the drinking can increase. And so I thought today's show, I would just spend some time taking a look at the brain pieces involved in that, because the, the, the brain pieces that are involved in, in alcohol use are really significant. It's a depressant. So if stuff's bothering you, it's not going to help. It's going to reduce your capacity to think and problem solve. And it's also a disinhibitor, which means that normally things that we wouldn't do, we've got more likelihood that we're going to do some of that stuff. So in short, it does not make us smarter. Anyway, uh, I got to do a share screen thing here. And this is the one I want. I have no idea if you can see what I'm doing. And... Slideshow. Yes, I'm talking to myself. From the beginning. Okay, so there is a Shutterstock picture of alcohol, and there's all sorts of sizes and shapes and bottles and stuff like that there. And, and alcohol is a, a significant part of our society. It is something that lots of people have in their homes. It's a really common commodity. And like a lot of things, it's not really well understood. So let's take a little bit of time looking at that. So I'm gonna show you some spec scan images of brains. So brains are, they're our operating system. They're the things that make us work. And so keeping our brain healthy and keeping it in good shape helps us be better and do better. And so uh, if we, this is a, so spec scans look at, really they look at blood flow and the areas that look like holes or look like uh, cavities are areas that aren't getting proper blood supply. So this, this is a healthy brain. The primary, or one of the primary neurotransmitters in the brain is dopamine. So it's responsible for pleasure. It's also responsible for the anticipation of pleasure. And it's also uh, uh, really critical for brain operations. It's, it's like gasoline for your brain. It runs everything. It, it allows things to, to interconnect and operate properly. And so we want to try and keep appropriate levels of it all the time. If we're doing things that disrupt the availability of dopamine, then that starts to change our brain's capacity to work. And, you know, just like, you know, we've all got, uh, or most of us have cell phones, we take care of them. We put them in expensive cases and we try not to drop them in the sink or the toilet or things like that, because that can hurt them. And we need to take just as good care of what we're putting into our brain, how, how we look after it. So, you know, I've talked about this multiple times, but I think I'll just go over it quickly again. The two neurotransmitters that are critical for mood really are dopamine and serotonin. And as long as they're, they're where they're supposed to be, generally we can feel and function fairly well. So food is a, a, something that we need. It activates our reward system and 
that helps us survive. The, the, one of the important reasons that, that we get pleasure from food is that that ensures that we're going to go back and look for more food. So alcohol works in the same brain pathway as food does, but the pleasure response that it creates is stronger. And I'll show you a video in a few minutes that explains this in a lot more detail. But essentially what happens, and I have to get my trusty laser pointer here, is food raises dopamine, serotonin about that much. Sex raises it a little bit more than that. It's a little bit stronger reward. Drugs, including alcohol, significantly raise those two things. And that part of the brain doesn't really think. It just responds to stimulus. So it doesn't know that that's too much. When that wears off, and this is, this is why this stuff is a problem, when that wears off, it reduces the availability of dopamine and serotonin, and then we, we don't feel okay. And just like if we're hungry, we look for food. When we don't feel okay, we're gonna look for something that, that tries to fix that. And so we'll go drink some more, because that seems to work, and initially it does. But you notice that it didn't go up as high as it did the time before. When that wears off, because we're overstressing those two systems, it goes down a little bit further and we feel worse. We start to feel depressed, we start to feel a little bit frustrated, and that's not comfortable. And if we're not comfortable, we will try and fix that. Just like if we're hungry, we will look for food. We'll go and look for the thing that worked over here, and we'll do it again, and it works again. But again, it doesn't go as high as it did the time before. And really quickly, we slide down this chemical hill, and it doesn't take very long. And it doesn't, you know, and you, do, you don't have to fit those um, sort of criteria of, of somebody who ha is, has a huge alcohol problem for this to start to happen. As soon as you start to drink too much or too often, it starts to degrade your brain's ability to produce enough dopamine and serotonin and keep it where it's supposed to. And we end up down here where we don't feel good. You know, we're, we're depressed, we're agitated, we're frustrated, we can't think properly. Because as soon as you don't have enough dopamine, it's hard to think, it's hard to process, and then everything becomes uh, difficult to manage. So uh, here's this video. Uh, it's a fairly complicated explanation on what's going on with all this brain chemical stuff. And one of the things that I didn't talk about is GABA, which is another uh, neurotransmitter. And this will explain that better than I can. People who exhibit the behavior associated with being addicted to alcohol do not get there overnight. Addiction happens when alcohol causes unusual chemical activity in the central nervous system. In a healthy person, specialized chemicals, neurotransmitters, travel throughout the brain, sending signals from nerve cell to nerve cell to make one behave appropriately in response to what is happening around them. In a person addicted to alcohol, the story is different. Both moderate and heavy drinking can lead to inappropriate aggressive behavior. Many people know that alcohol is a depressant. This is referring to its ability to depress or slow down brain processing. This alteration is a part of the reason a person behaves uncharacteristically and aggressively. This is gamma amino butyric acid or GABA. It is the brain's primary inhibitory neurotransmitter. An inhibitory neurotransmitter is a messenger that acts like a stoplight, temporarily stopping a neurological signal in its path inside the brain. This is a good thing in healthy circumstances. Looking at GABA in its natural surroundings, we find it traveling down the axon of a neuron in the brain. At the terminal end, we find a synapse. 
the space between two neurons where a signal is transmitted from one to the next through the release of a neurotransmitter chemical. Here, tiny electrically charged particles are found that power a signal into the next neuron. For a signal to fire, the receiving neuron must have a much higher positive charge than negative charge. These charged particles enter the neuron through tiny receptor channels. GABA molecules leave the presynaptic neuron and bind to GABA receptors on the surface of the next neuron. Because it is an inhibitory neurotransmitter, it opens the receptor for negatively charged particles to course through, making it virtually impossible for subsequent signals to fire. Remember, there needs to be a high enough positive charge for a signal to fire, which is very difficult to achieve with such a high negative charge to now overcome. Because of this, signals are momentarily blocked from traveling into the next neuron. When GABA detaches itself from the receptor, the channel closes and negatively charged particles stop going through. The neuron is ready again to receive stimulatory signals. We're used to seeing alcohol like this. But now let's take a look at it like this. Ethanol. This is what makes a drink alcoholic. When swallowed, it goes down into your stomach and digestive tract. The digestive tract absorbs the nutrients from what you just ate or drank. When something is absorbed, it goes into the bloodstream, which will transport it all over your body, including your brain. This all happens within minutes. With alcohol present, the activity of GABA receptors increases. This means it inhibits a signal more often and longer than it normally would. This happens all over the brain. When a prolonged depressant effect happens in the following areas of the brain, the result is clearly expressed as a change in behavior. The cerebral cortex is associated with thinking, decision-making, emotions, and the five senses. The hippocampus controls memory. The medulla is responsible for involuntary processes, such as breathing and body temperature. And the cerebellum coordinates your voluntary movements, such as walking and picking up objects. Research shows a link between alcohol and aggression and the roles that the chemicals serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine might play. We know dopamine to be involved in the reason people become addicted to alcohol. Dopamine is found in the mesolimbic reward pathway in the ventral striatum. When you do things that are necessary for survival, such as eating food, drinking water, and having sex, it courses around this circuit of interconnected neurons in the brain, making you feel good. You are subconsciously rewarded for doing that action. Unfortunately, ethanol drives dopamine to make you feel extra good for drinking alcohol. To better understand the brain's reward system, consider this. When you give your body food or water, your brain rewards you with a feeling of satisfaction. This encourages you to repeat the action, making your brain and whole body happy. When you start giving your body alcohol, your brain rewards you with a more sizable feeling of satisfaction. This encourages you to drink more and continue the euphoric feeling. But alcohol is different from food or water. The brain actually becomes desensitized to alcohol the more you drink it. This means that drinking the amount of alcohol that made you feel great in the past doesn't make you feel nearly as good, so you drink more. With more and more alcohol present in the system, the damage goes beyond the brain. Exposure to alcohol will cause damage to the esophagus, as well as the stomach, liver, and kidneys. When rewarding oneself with a drink, think about the implications to the brain's built-in reward system. Current research shows that heavy alcohol use is linked to aggression and can lead to the following. Violent crime, breakdown of the family, behavioral health problems, 
unemployment, disrupted friendships, legal problems, and various medical conditions. If you are experiencing any of these, or you feel you need help, please refer to the following resources. Help is available. So that's, uh, I can never get out of these things for some reason. There, that's a fairly complicated look at what I was explaining with way better graphics and stuff than I have. But the, the big thing to understand is that, that although we like the immediate effect of alcohol, it starts to create some changes. So that's a, this is a normal spec scan of the, of the top side of a brain of a person that doesn't use alcohol. That's a bottom up view of the same person. And this part up here is our uh, prefrontal cortex. That's the part of our brain that does the thinking and problem solving. This central area is limbic system, and that's our emotional core. And then side areas are our learning and memory and a, a bit of aggression control. And then this bottom area is uh, physical stuff. So one of the things that happens with uh, the overstimulation from alcohol is that this part of our brain, which is our amygdala, which is the thing that gets us excited, interested, gets us paying attention to stuff, because it's being constantly or regularly overstimulated by alcohol, uh, six months of that, and it loses some of its capacity to respond. And so it is less responsive. So what that means to us, how that feels, is that things that used to be interesting or exciting don't seem to do it anymore. They don't seem to be as much fun, unless we have a couple of drinks first, and then a year of too much or too often, and our amygdala is even less responsive. And then often how that feels is the only thing that I really want to do is, is have a drink. So this is, the, this is a spec scan of a 24-year-old weekend binge drinker. This is somebody that's been getting drunk on the weekends since he was 17. So seven years of alcohol misuse like too much, too often. And, and again, you know, when we look at alcohol problems, we often think, well, you know, unless I'm drinking every day, unless I'm drinking in the morning, unless I'm, you know, there's a whole bunch of things that we can sort of set up as, as lines that we don't want to cross. But it's the, the lines way back behind that somewhere. So uh, drinking too much every weekend starts to change your brain. Now, alcohol doesn't put physical holes in your brain, but because it reduces availability of those brain chemicals, we start to get areas of our brain that aren't working properly. So remember, this part up here is uh, thinking, figuring out, problem solving, stress management, self-assessment. And this isn't just when we are drinking. When we drink regularly too much, our brain is like this all the time. And so everything becomes a little bit more difficult to manage. This is our emotional core. And so when that's not working well, emotionally we aren't properly connected to things. And then it even starts to uh, impact some, some physical changes in us. If we look at someone who has alcoholism or uh, alcohol use disorder, which is the, the probably better terminology for it, their brain is much less active. There's much less activity in their brain. This one is uh, someone who's normal. And so again, we see that there are significant changes in brain activity, not just when we're drinking, but all the time. And this is a rot rotational scan. This person has a poly substance use problem. So using alcohol, cannabis, and uh, cocaine. And again, that those changes uh, exist, not just when we're impaired by the drug, but all the time. Uh, this 
should work, but it's not going to for some reason. Okay, we'll skip well, that. So oh, there it goes. Sorry. And then, after getting drunk. Drinking begins. So this guy is going to drink six beer in about two hours. He's a big guy, like two, 15 to 20 pounds, 220 pounds. So he is just over the legal legal limit of 0 0.08. Alcohol is a very significant suppressor of brain activity. It shuts down brain activity. You can see you won't think as clearly. You won't make as good a decision. You'll be more impulsive. You'll act like you're only working without brain. I know that I can drive home safely right now. Assuming that no other drivers cut in front of me and, and you know, smash into me. Nathan undergoes his second scan. It's now time to see if there's a difference between his sober and his intoxicated brain. Nathan's sober brain is on the left. His brain on alcohol on the right. Yeah. Looks like Swiss cheese. If you look back here, here's your coordination part of your brain. You see how much smaller it is. And so even though your perception is, you can drive no problem, it'll be the same. That part of your brain that controls that is not the same. The thing I'm very concerned about with your brain is your ability to drink more and more and still be able to function. And we can see it hurting your brain, and you're still standing, which means your cells are craving alcohol. You just have to ask yourself, you know, which, which brain do you want? I'll take Benjamin. the better of the two. <laughs> I want to know what mine looks like now. It's Tara's turn next. So she didn't drink before this. Will Tara's brain already show signs of alcohol damage? But she drinks on the weekends, and she's 17. What do you mean? It's like there's a lot of holes. It's already beginning to get some bumps. Really? And we're beginning to see already there's some decreased activity in your brain. And that's not what you want. You see this little valley going between the two signs? Yeah. That shouldn't be there. A little too young to have that. I mean, we get that as we age. If you continue to drink, it's going to get worse. Given that, you also have a lot of really good brain activity. And odds are because you're young, it'll come back and you'll be able to have a happy life. If you keep drinking when you're 30, you'll have the brain of a 70 year old. No. Yeah. I'm dead serious. <laughs> See, when you say that, that there's, that there's no way I can continue with that. So, again, you know, what we think about this stuff really matters. If you think it's not hurting you and you think what you're doing is normal, that is a way to get yourself into trouble. So, so here are four alcohol. Well, I just want to say one more thing about Tara. And, and so her reaction is really similar. Like, we don't think that this stuff hurts us when, we not, when we're not doing it. Most of us have an awareness that if we drink too much, uh, there's a risk of doing something stupid or it affecting us. But there's a really uh, minimal understanding of the longer term effects in between drinks. And so uh, here are uh, four alcohol questions to, uh, to ask yourself. First one is, do you ever drink by yourself? So keep track of your yeses and nos. Do you pre-drink? If you're going out to hang out with friends or going out on an activity, do you have a drink or two or three uh, in preparation to that, to get a little bit of a buzz on or to relax yourself if you have some social anxiety? Do you often drink too much, like more than you plan, uh, affecting you either the next day, waking up and thinking, oh geez, I shouldn't have done that, or creating situations that you regret and do you crave drinking do you start thinking about it ahead of time do you get excited about it so if if you said yes to one of those questions that's an indicator that your alcohol use is becoming problematic if you said yes to more than one of those questions you're you're starting to meet criteria for a substance use disorder alcohol use disorder which probably isn't what you want. And so 
again, all, uh, I'm always trying to help people self-assess. So if you did say yes to any of those questions, that's a sign that your alcohol use isn't in a comfortable place. So taking a break from it would be really useful. And it's interesting because most people don't think they have a problem. But if the idea of leaving alcohol alone for a period of time, even a couple of weeks, is uncomfortable for you, that's very telling. That's, that's saying that this stuff is probably bigger than you want it to be. Uh, depression symptoms, feeling hopeless. And right now, there's lots of that going on because of this pandemic situation. People are feeling hopeless. But if you start to drink because of that, that's going to make things worse. That's going to increase the, that hopelessness. Restless and crabby, the same thing. You know, lots of people, when they get restless and crabby, think, oh, I need a drink. And again, you might get some immediate short-term relief, but it's going to make that situation worse. Don't care. Well, remember, alcohol is a disinhibitor. So it's going to make you care less, uh, changes your appetite. Lots of people, when they start drinking regularly, actually stop eating because they, they start getting calories from alcohol in it. And it doesn't, also, it doesn't just inhibit behavior, it also inhibits appetite. Uh, it can put you in situations where because you're disinhibited, you could harm yourself. There's... Uh, physical symptoms, stomach aches, headaches of depression that uh, are made worse by alcohol. Uh, and when they don't have a cause, that's something else. You know, those are warning signs that, that if you've got depression, alcohol is making it worse. And so there's our four questions. Is what you're thinking true? So think about how you were thinking about alcohol before you watch this and is it really true? Because we like alternative facts. We like things that fit what we, uh, what we want them to. And then how are you feeling you're acting because of how you're thinking? So if you thought there's nothing the matter with my alcohol use, and after watching this, you realize that, well, maybe there is, then that gives you a huge opportunity to change, uh, to get yourself a little bit better. So that's... Uh, that's all I wanted to get into today. So thanks for watching. We've been getting really good response from, from this stuff. Please, if you find this interesting, share it to some of your friends and family. And I will be back tomorrow. You have a good day. Thanks.